Everyone, the subcommittee on water, oceans, and wildlife will come to order. We're meeting today to examine Colorado River drought conditions. And this meeting is measures, being recorded. Uh, response measures for the first of two meetings on this important subject. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearing uh, will be limited to the chairman and ranking minority member. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help keep members on their schedule. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. And hearing no objection, that is so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that Representative Teresa Legere Fernandez, Representative Susie Lee, and Representative Dina Titus join the hearing to ask questions of the witnesses. Again, hearing no objection, that is so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at the following email address, hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that as with our in-person meetings, members are responsible for their own microphones. So um, please do mute when you're not speaking and members will be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses who are experiencing any technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. And I will now recognize myself uh, for a brief opening statement. So thanks again uh, for joining us for the first of two meetings that we're having on Colorado River drought conditions and response measures. The Colorado River is often called the hardest working river in the West, and that's because it does so much for so many. The fact that we are meeting to hear testimony from more than 15 witnesses covering two separate days really speaks to this very fact. The Colorado River supplies water to communities across seven Western states, serves 40 million people from Colorado, Colorado to uh, California. And along the way, this river and its tributaries flow through six national parks and monuments. Also, it supports a multitude of fish and wildlife, nearly 6 million acres of irrigated agriculture, and $1.4 trillion in economic activity every single year. Unfortunately, Unprecedented drought conditions are now creating enormous challenges for this important river and for those who depend on it. In August, the Bureau of Reclamation made the first ever shortage declaration in the lower Colorado River uh, Basin. And that, of course, is due to severe drought and low reservoir conditions, which have triggered reduced water releases from Lake Mead. Uh, these are actions, um, there are actions that were recently taken in the upper basin as well to slow declining water levels at Lake Powell. Water levels at Lake Mead and Lake Powell, the Colorado River's two largest reservoirs, have declined to lows that haven't been seen since those reservoirs were first filled, which understandably has drawn a lot of national attention and concern. After more than two decades of drought with no end in sight, it's clear, to most of us at least, that climate change is fundamentally altering the Colorado River. It's decreasing the amount of water available from this key river, which was already over allocated. Climate scientists are telling us to expect hotter, drier conditions, even less water uh, being available in the upcoming years. In fact, some scientists describe what we're now seeing in the Southwest as a long-term shift in climate called aridification that portends a multi-decade mega drought. Now this is deeply concerning for tens of millions of people who depend on the Colorado River. It's particularly concerning for communities that already face water insecurity challenges, which have long affected tribal communities more than any other across the Colorado River Basin. And I should note that there are 30 tribal nations across the Colorado River Basin. Under the Winters Doctrine, which was first recognized by the Supreme Court in 1908, these tribes have significant legal rights to enough water from the Colorado River to secure and maintain viable homelands. And yet, tribes have been historically excluded from Colorado River management and decision making. It's essential from both the practical and moral perspective that moving forward, tribes play a significant role in the management and decision-making process on the Colorado River. And I look forward to more discussion uh, on that need today. 
I want to also note that while we face significant challenges, we have some effective tools in place to help deal with the worst effects of this drought. This includes the measures included in the Colorado River Drought Contingency Plan, which was authorized through legislation led by our chairman, Raul Grijalva, in the last Congress, but still more action is needed. So we look forward to hearing from federal, state, and tribal government witnesses today on what more can be done to respond to these unprecedented climate challenges we're seeing across the Colorado River Basin. We'll also discuss some of the initiatives being led by members of this committee, which include investments in near-term drought response, investments in water rights settlements, Salton Sea improvement projects, and investments in drought-proof water recycling projects that are being led by water ma managers across the Colorado River Basin. I look forward to hearing more today and next week about the need for future Colorado River management plans to effectively incorporate climate science. We've had a lot of, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So uh, with that, I'd like to now yield and recognize Ranking Member Bentz for his opening remarks. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. It, it, uh, this is a, a welcome committee hearing on an issue that is of incredible importance, not only uh, to the seven states involved with Colorado, but all of uh, all of the Western United States. And of course, as you mentioned, it, this is the first of a two part hearing uh, on the consequences of this two decades long drought. I'm very happy that we're, we're, we're spending that kind of time on this issue. It is, it is certainly that important. Um, of course, uh, as we know, and as I mentioned, this drought isn't affecting just the Colorado, it's affecting all of Oregon, California, Washington, and all other Western United States. Um, over and, and since our last meeting on drought, which is about five months ago, about 5.8 million acres have burned up uh, here in Oregon and California. And project water users in Oregon's Klamath region and large portions of the California Central Valley project have been given zero allocations of water. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, they're, they're not the only ones. Uh, this absence of water has devastated communities throughout the Western United States. And thousands of people are desperately worried right now that another, uh, yet another year of drought will be the nail in the coffin for many, many farming, ranching, and actually uh, communities across the West. And meanwhile, at the time of massive supply chain problems throughout our entire economy, the last thing we need is to rely on foreign countries for our food because of more water shortages. I, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, that today our discussion is really about choices uh, between uh, a, a lot of different uses of water, and I'm going to be very interested in and listening to folks uh, talk about how in the world we're going to make those choices. Um, so a little about the history of the Colorado, and I know the folks uh, testifying today know far more about it than I, but if, the, if there was ever an illustration on, I would like to say a microcosm basis, but it's not really true because the Colorado is so big, uh, this, the situation the Colorado is facing is so uh, reflective of what we're going to be seeing all over the West. So. Whatever we come up with today, I think is going to be a template of some sort for the type of uh, issues we're facing um, here in Oregon, California, Washington, Nevada, and so forth. Uh, so uh, one thing is easy, I suppose, to pop over is the incredible value of, of the Colorado system and then the folks that put it together all those years ago to be commended. I, I know there's many who, who find fault with how how the Colorado was developed. I, I reference, of course, the book Science Be Damned by Eric Kuhn and John Fleck, an interesting book, uh, one that I think Monday morning quarterbacks a lot of things, but on the other hand, makes some good points about optimism when it comes to uh, building storage. On the other hand, uh, without storage, uh, can we imagine what would be happening now uh, in California, uh, Phoenix, and other places benefited by, by these systems? So uh, I, one of the things, I, I, of course, I, I am a water lawyer. I've spent literally hundreds, if not thousands of hours involved in all types of water negotiation, water litigation, dam relicensing, uh, never ending negotiations over impossible circumstances of, of uh, zero sum games of allocating water and also being involved in the Columbia River Treaty negotiations with Canada and on and on and on. Uh, so this, Today's hearing is so important and so uh, so welcome in many ways. I just wish it wasn't coming before us in such uh, such a uh, a period of fear that we may not 
may not have more water to deal with, and in fact, we'll probably have less. So I, I don't anticipate breakthroughs today, but I do expect the continuation of the processes that that were referenced, Mr. Chair, uh, the DCPs, the, that is the drought contingency plans and other tools to try to address the impossibility of allocating water between everybody that needs it. With that, Mr. Chair, I, I want to thank uh, I want to thank all the folks that that are that are going to testify today in advance of their testimony. I look forward to a productive conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Bentz. I understand that the chair of the full Natural Resources Committee, Mr. Grijalva, who has uh, been a great leader on these issues, uh, is with us to provide an opening statement. So, Chairman Grijalva, uh, please, you're recognized for five minutes. Just a quick comment uh, to thank you, uh, Chairman Huffman, for, for the hearings. Uh, vital, vital discussion that uh, your, your committee is not overlooking and and we all appreciate that. And all of us that uh, represent that region, we uh, appreciate that very much. And uh, I want to just associate myself uh, with your opening comments, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, you know, uh, I think we need a comprehensive initiative, and that's where you're going to deal with the Colorado River and to deal with uh, the mega drought. And uh, your point about, uh, I think, is, uh, is, is really important. I mentioned the watershed around the Colorado River so vital to its life, and that needs protection as well, particularly around the Grand Canyon. And I, I, I appreciate these uh, this hearing very much. And uh, you know, what we passed in reconciliation, Mr. Chairman, uh, dealt with additional significant resources to deal with the question at hand here. I uh, dealt with significant resources to settle. Uh, to create to have settlements with 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 in Indian nations regarding water and to be able to have uh, resources for infrastructure for tribal nations to begin to use uh, and and be able to uh, create viable communities themselves and so that's where we're at and I, I and I appreciate it Mr. Uh, chairman and, uh, and I yield back thank you chair Grijalva. Uh, we will now hear testimony starting with today's first panel featuring federal and tribal government witnesses. Uh, before introducing our witnesses today, uh, I'll re remind uh, non-administration witnesses that they're encouraged to participate in the Witness Diversity Survey created by the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Witnesses may refer to their hearing invitation materials for further information on that. Under our committee rules, uh, please limit your oral statements to five minutes. Uh, your entire statement will appear in the hearing record, however, and when you begin speaking, the timer will uh, start counting down. Uh, it will turn orange when you have one minute left, and I do recommend that members and witnesses uh, who are joining remotely use the grid view uh, in WebEx here so that you can lock the timer on your screen. After your testimony is complete, please do remember to mute yourself to avoid inadvertent background noise, and I will allow all of our witnesses to testify before we begin questioning. Uh, so we'll first hear testimony from Ms. Uh, Tanya Trujillo, Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the Department of Interior. The chair now recognizes Ms. Trujillo to testify for five minutes. Do we have assist, Assistant Secretary Trujillo? Um, let me just ask our staff if we are having some kind of technical difficulty. Uh, Assistant Secretary Trujillo, I believe you're muted, which uh, you, you will not be the first offender uh, in that regard. We've all done it, but if you could unmute yourself, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you for your patience, folks, while we figure out why we don't have audio for the Assistant Secretary. Um, Tell you what, while we try to work the, yeah, do we, do we have her now? It says star six to unmute. We got you. 
Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you. Hooray. Well, thank you. You're recognized okay. for five minutes. Take it away. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon. I'm Tanya Trujillo, the Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the Department of the Interior. I am honored to be part of the panel today with some of our tribal partners regarding the ongoing drought conditions in the Colorado River Basin. And as you noted, it's also significant that the governor's representatives from all seven basin states will be here today to testify as well. The Colorado River binds us together. We have a proven track record over the recent decades of being able to find ways to adapt to the changing conditions we are facing. It will be essential for us to continue to work together to develop additional innovative agreements to address the ongoing challenges. Climate change is real, and we are seeing the effects of climate change in the Colorado River Basin every day. The effects include the extended drought, extreme temperatures, extensive wildfires, and in some places, flooding and landslides that are affecting our communities and our environment. Now is the time to take innovative actions to respond to them. The Department of the Interior is committed to addressing the challenges of climate change in the Colorado River Basin by utilizing science-based innovative strategies and working cooperatively with the diverse communities that rely on the river. We are working at Interior with our sister agencies and with states, tribes, and local entities to respond to the drought throughout the West and in the basin. In January, or since January, we have been providing funding to over 220 different projects around the West. And we were able to recently reprogram $100 million of dollars to be able to be responsive to the drought conditions we are seeing through various programs that we have available. They include improvements to infrastructure and continued drought contingency planning efforts. We also received additional funding through the disaster relief bill. We are working to be able to get that funding out to the local and tribal communities as soon as possible. We appreciate Congress's continued support for these important issues. October 1st marks the, the first year, the beginning of the new water year across the West, and we are grateful for reports of initial snow in some of the states and some of the areas, but we know that we are going to be starting out with a deficit. We are starting out with challenging water supply conditions in many of the basins that in facing situations that are significantly below average. In the Colorado River Basin, Lake Powell and Lake Mead are currently at historically low levels. As you noted on October, excuse me, on August 16th, we announced the operating conditions for next year, and we announced the first first tier shortage in the lower basin. We have worked collaboratively in this basin to plan ahead for these conditions, but we know we need to be continuing to do more. Intent interior will work to utilize the best available science and technical expertise and work collaboratively to help to inform our decisions and work with our partners on our collective decision making in the basin. We will continue to support additional investments and improvements to water infrastructure to invest that include investments in new technology and always emphasizing the need for continued collaboration on how we can best be able to to meet the needs of the communities and allow them to utilize the federal resources that we have available. The testimony we will hear today will highlight the challenges that we face in many of our areas around the Colorado River Basin. We know to address the challenges, we will urgently need to build upon the existing tools that we have and to expand upon the work that we have done. That work helps us conserve water, protect the environment, preserve our hydropower resources, and operate our infrastructure efficiently. The progress that we have made has been, has been accomplished through the strong partnerships that we have with the states, with the tribes, with the water users, and communities throughout the basin. We look forward to that continued coordination into the future. Thank you all for recognizing the importance of this issue and for holding the hearing today. 
I would be happy to follow up with any, uh, answer any questions as a follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Trujillo. I will now uh, call upon Congresswoman Teresa Legere Fernandez to introduce our next witness. Thank you so much, Chair Huffman, for giving me this opportunity to participate in this important hearing and to introduce the next witness. You know, I'm really excited that two constituents from my beautifully diverse third district in New Mexico are testifying today. Tanya Turio, thank you very much for your testimony, and Mr. Daryl B. Hill. So I've known Daryl B. Hill uh, going back decades from when I served as general counsel for the Hickory Apache Nation. At present, he is the water administrator for the nation, and among many roles, he's also the co-facilitator for the Water and Tribes Initiative in the Colorado River Basin. He's also chairman of Water is Life uh, Partnership. He is truly a leader for communities seeking long-term water sustainability and equity. Thank you so much for being here today, Mr. B. Hill. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. B. Hill. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Hoffman and Ranking Member Benz and other members of the subcommittee. And thank you for the opportunity to testify about the drought situation in the Western United States. And I can't, I couldn't, can't go on any further except uh, uh, acknowledging, of course, you know, my representative and, and Teresa Ledger, a long, long decades long friend of the Hikuria. And of course, my friend, uh, Representative Melanie Stansberry, and also my friend and fellow New Mexican Assistant Secretary Trujillo. Uh, thank you so much, you know, uh, uh, for, for 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 the opportunity today, and it's so nice to hear you. And thank you, Teresa, for that 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 acknowledgement. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Chairman uh, Grijalva, for for the opening statements as well. I'm here uh, uh, presenting this to you at the lovely uh, in Durango, Colorado, at Fort Lewis College, where, as you uh, you may or may not know, has an enrollment of. Uh, over 30% of, 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 of Native American students. So a pretty special place to be at, to be able to provide this to you. I'm gonna kind of paraphrase my, my testimony since I, I know that it, it takes seven minutes to read the whole thing. But as been mentioned before, my name is Daryl V. Hill and I am an enrolled member of the Hickory Apache Nation. I'm also of Camus and Zia Pueblo descent. Uh, my reservation is, nor is in north central New Mexico and extends from the New Mexico Colorado border 70 miles south. My tribe has significant water rights in the Colorado River Basin, and, and, I, and as been mentioned, I've had the honor of, of being my water administrator and thank uh, my president, Edward Velarde, and my legislative council for continuing to trust and, and empower me to be able to speak on behalf of this nation in terms of something that's absolute importance to my tribe, which is our water rights and the spiritual value of our water rights. Um, and, and again, you know, we, we, we say this all in the, in the backdrop of understanding that this, is, this conversation is absolutely vital and important and, you know, considering where we're at at this moment in time, you know, not only with, uh, uh, with the situation with climate, but, you know, with uh, geopolitical kind of conversations that are going on. So this is not only about in, important to the tribes, but uh, as been mentioned before, it's important to the entire basin, the 30 sovereigns in the basin, and this country as a whole. I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, about the past, present, and future role of tribes in the Colorado River Basin, as we understand. My key message is, is that sovereigns in the basin, tribes along with federal and state governments, need to be at the decision-making table. Tribes have senior water rights to at least 25% of the current natural flow of the Colorado River and have historically been excluded from decision-making or consulted only after decisions have been made. It is my sincere hope that, that, the, that the attention and the action of this com committee represents the beginning of, of a new chapter in the management of the Colorado River, a chapter in which tribes are treated with the same dignity and respect and responsibility as other sovereigns in the basin. And I think it's really important to understand, you know, that tribes have lived sustainably in the basin for a millennium and continue to do so today. Despite Mother Nature's challenges, colonization, systemic strategies to terminate, exterminate, and assimilate the indigenous people of this country, we, and we have experienced not only hundreds, but thousands of years of sustainable and adaptive living. We understand the importance of honoring the very things that keep us alive, that feed us and quench our thirst. 
and it's important to provide just a little bit of context because you, you know, uh, as been stated, you know, we're at a pivotal moment in time. You know, we're, next year will be the 100th anniversary of the Colorado River Compact, the foundational law of the river. And at that time, it's just important to understand the context of where my tribe was at that time. In, in 1887, uh, our, our reservation was established, you know, after our own kind of trail of tears. And we survived on government rations outside of our traditional homeland. And, and although we were historically nomadic, you know, government tried to make us farmers and ranchers and lands that didn't really support those activities. And we didn't establish a governance structure at our, my reservation until the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934 and, and couldn't vote it, you know, in elections until 1948 and did not have plumbing in the town of Dulce in the, until the 1960s. And it's important to note that my, my nation settled its waters, you know, nearly 100 years after the Colorado River Compact in 1992 during the early years of tribal settlements. Uh, and so, as been mentioned before, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, how, how do we get inclusive of, of, of tribes? How do we make tribes part of this process? The current structures do not allow for any of that to happen. So inside my testimony, I definitely line out a way of, you know, creating something that, that where we don't have to recreate the wheel in terms of a model that was created in the Columbia River Basin that was mentioned a little bit earlier that looks a lot similar in terms of the components of, of you know, what could be built in the future. But, you know, given the amount of tribal water rights that the that, that tribes have and, and, and the commitment and the, 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 the number of thousands of years that we've lived here, they're absolutely, the, the, the current structure doesn't account for that. Absolutely something new needs to be built where not only those tribal voices are in heard or in, included in the conversation, but the other uh, voices that haven't been traditionally heard are integrated into that. So we build a, a future that, that, that uh, together in the basin that would be really, really unique in terms of transforming the federal tribal uh, sovereign relationship. So I really appreciate the time Thank today. And, and please, I, I ask you to take a look at my testimony because I go into the specifics, not only about you know, what the, the division is that my nation has in terms of how we can participate, but also it has links to you know, the, the work that we've done in the basin to really build on that collaborative effort so that we can we build it together. Appreciate that, Mr. Together. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And uh, finally, we will hear from uh, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Amelia Flores of the Colorado River Indian Tribes next. Chairwoman, you are recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Huffman and Ranking Member Vince. My name is Amelia Flores. I am the Chairwoman of the Colorado River Indian Tribes. I appreciate the invitation to testify today on behalf of my people about the drought and its, and its impacts on the Colorado River. That is the namesake of our sovereign government. I also wanna thank Chairman Grijalva for his work to get our La Paz lands returned and his support for not only CRIT, but all native people and tribal governments. The Colorado River Indian Reservation is separated by more than 70 miles of the Colorado River running through our lands located in both California and Arizona. We have the right to divert 719,000 acre feet and currently using over 300,000 acre feet, the same amount used by the state of Nevada. Since time immemorial, the river has sustained us. I am here today to tell you that we are committed to helping to support the river that has provided for us and we have water to offer for this effort. The Colorado River is suffering not only from drought, but climate change that is forcing all of us to change our relationship with its water. We must use its water more efficiently and ensure that each drop provides maximum benefits so that others are not cut off entirely. This will require new and improved water delivery infrastructure, especially on tribal reservation including ours. We have received funding from the Water Smart Program and USDA programs to make improvements to the federal irrigation project and our farmlands. But the needs greatly exceed the capacity of these programs and our ability to provide the required 50% matching funds. By joining with the state, local, and private sector with creative partnerships, we have started to make up for the lack of federal investment in the BIA irrigation project. 
The committee's inclusion of $150 million in the reconciliation proposal to assist tribal governments addressing the drought will greatly help us and other tribes. We hold the senior water right for the lower basin and are the largest single user of the water from the Colorado River in Arizona. Our water right was quantified by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Arizona versus California decision with a priority date of 1865 and is not likely to be shortened. Despite the challenges our tribe faces, we are providing help to the rest of the lower basin through the drought contingency plan, which was authorized by legislation approved by this committee. The Colorado River Indian tribes are creating more than 150,000 acre feet of water for Lake Mead as system conservation. This water and our ICS contributions since 2016 have raised the water levels in the lake by more than three feet. In addition, we have been working with the state of Arizona, environmental leaders, and the water users to develop a legislative proposal that will authorize us to lease our water to other users in the state. This is the same right that Congress has authorized for other tribal governments in Arizona and across the West. Because our water rights were adjudicated by the Supreme Court, Congress has not acted on them and we lack the authority to lease water because of the prohibitions in the 300-year-old Indian Trade and Intercourse Act. Without the right to lease our water, we can do little to directly assist communities in Arizona or our neighbors on the river who may face drastic water shortages in the coming years. We have worked with stakeholders in the state of Arizona for over five years to develop the proposed legislation that will provide us the same sovereign rights over our water that other tribal governments have. Our proposed legislation will help make Arizona more water resilient and will provide our tribe with the financial resources to fund improvements to the irrigation project so that our water use may become efficient. Greater efficiency on our reservation means we can do more to help the river. The Colorado River Indian tribes are committed to working with the United States to support on-river habitat, including providing more water and land for endangered species protection. Our legislative proposal will also permit us to lease secure water supplies to third parties, including municipalities on the river and those served by the CAP that are facing shortages. This may reduce the demand for groundwater pumping that is not sustainable in Arizona. Our first priority water right can be diverted directly from the Colorado River with little to no risk of reducing reduction during shortages and will limit the need for new or additional water delivery infrastructure. Leasing our water for off-reservation use does include a cost for us. If you visit our reservation, you will see more than 10,000 acres of our farmland sitting fallow. A reminder that our people have chosen to protect the health of the river. Our legislative proposal will only allow leasing of water we have consumptively used on the reservation for at least four of five recent years. This will keep the river and all other water users whole. Thank you, we are Chair. simply requesting the right to decide for ourselves how to best use our water because we do not have this right today. It has been an honor to be here today and I thank you for inviting me. I will submit written testimony and am pleased to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Appreciate that, Chairwoman Flores. Uh, let me remind members of the committee uh, that Rule 3D imposes a five-minute limit on questions. We will now turn to member questions, and I'll recognize members uh, starting with myself. And uh, Chair Flores, I would like to to begin with you, please. Um, thanks again for joining us. I, I appreciated uh, the the conversation about how your tribe is committed to providing the Colorado River the same support it has provided us, in your words, for so long. 
Uh, and then you continued by talking about how your tribe will support water uses through leases that strengthen the health of the Colorado River. So I have no doubt about your commitment here and appreciate your comments, uh, but I do want to follow up uh, on that subject and just ask about NEPA, uh, National Environmental Policy Act, one of our important environmental protections in federal law, uh, which spotlights the environmental impacts of any proposed actions and develops alternatives uh, that can be chosen to avoid or limit harmful environmental impacts and unintended consequences. So I just wanna ask, as you develop and refine your legislation on water leasing, uh, will you support the preservation of the NEPA process and other environmental protections uh, in, in a manner similar to what I understand has been done with other tribal water leases in Arizona and elsewhere? Thank you for your question. Um, Chairman Huffman, yes, we will follow all the requirements that um, uh, other tribes have um, uh, been imposed with. Okay, thank you for that. And I uh, want to also ask you about the math problem that we have on the Colorado River. As you know, uh, we have legal entitlements that add up to 17.5 million acre feet of water every year. Uh, and with global warming and um, a more realistic, more modern assessment of the hydrology of the basin, um, we, we may only be able to deliver um, something much less than that. I'm hearing maybe 12.3 million acre feet. So given our math problem, um, I want to ask how you view the idea of prioritizing system conservation and future water leases and prioritizing um, other actions that can help us reduce overall consumption uh, and address this systemic shortage. Uh, would you s repeat that question again? Sure. It was a long question. <laughs> I, won't, I won't repeat the whole thing. You know that we but, have an imbalance in terms of the, the entitlements that far exceed what we now understand the hydrology of the basin will, will provide. And so I just want to ask how you view the idea of prioritizing uh, conservation in future water leases and also um, actions that can help us reduce overall consumption. Okay, our proposed legislation, thank you for the question. Our proposed legislation only permits us to lease water that we have been using already on our reservation. Uh, so we are required to reduce consumptive use to make water available in a lease. Okay, well, thank you. In the time I have left, I just have a couple of quick questions for Assistant Secretary Trujillo. And uh, Mr. Hill, I want to uh, start with large scale water recycling. We're seeing some, I think, very promising uh, collaboration in that regard. This is drought proof water supply, of course, that um, we've, we've uh, historically done on a smaller scale. But with these larger scale projects, we can actually uh, provide supply for millions of people. And so I want to ask you uh, where that fits into our our planning and our future on the Colorado River Basin. Okay, thank you. We we have a system for unmuting. Yes, we're water making recycling, progress. Water recycling is a very important component of our portfolio and the new authorization proposed in the infrastructure uh, package will be very helpful. I think it does represent a good opportunity to continue that collaboration that we've seen among the states to continue the partnering between the federal government and the local entities who are doing so much on the ground. And it's we're, we're going to have to do conservation in every state going forward to help con continue to address the conditions that we see. Thank you for thinking proactively about that issue. Thank you. And, and in the limited time I have left, could, could you just speak quickly about uh, salt and sea restoration? Why is this important, not just in California, but for other basin states? Yes, thank, thank you for recognizing the importance of the salt and sea. I formerly lived and worked in California and dealt with issues at the sea uh, firsthand. I met as recently as yesterday with representatives from the Imperial Irrigation District and Stability at the Salton Sea helps create stability with respect to the interactions within California, which also helps create stability with the other states and with our, our government. It was great to see support from the representatives in Arizona recently for additional 
um, salt and sea funding and support. And I know the upper basin states have similarly in the past re reached out and supported those efforts as well. So I think there is a recognition of the importance in a very broad context. Thank you very much. Um, Representative Benz, Ranking Member Benz, I see you uh, back on the screen. Are, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Excellent. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Madam Assistant Secretary, the, the situation, I know, I know you're familiar with it, uh, in the Klamath uh, has led this year to a a uh, choice between uh, in-stream interests on the one hand and farmers on the other, and the farmers lost. Uh, here in the Colorado, we see that the the same we we can see the same situation approaching, and I think it's only been uh, through incredible amounts of hard work by the folks in that basin to avoid such a stark choice. Uh, but let's let's assume the worst, and I hate to do so, but let's assume the worst. And when it comes to um, uh, the future of there there are endangered species on the Colorado. Uh, tell tell us if you will uh, what what you think the outcome would be if it came down to the four endangered species on the Colorado on the one hand, and uh, the out of stream water users on the other. What tell me will will the same thing happen on the Colorado that's happened on the Klamath? I can be un. Th thank you for. Thank you for that question. And, and as you noted, um, we have had tremendous challenges in the Klamath Basin. I know we've been in close coordination with your office and I know how important the issues are to you. And uh, I think you know we've been working very, very hard to try to balance uh, several competing demands for insufficient water supplies. We saw the worst record, the worst drought ever this past year and it was, uh, a horrible situation to, to be in. The Colorado River Basin can be a good model for continued coordination, including with respect to these kinds of, um, to the endangered species challenges that exist. There are three different recovery programs in the basin that have a wide range of support from the water users, from the environmental communities, from the tribes, from our federal team as well. And so we have a strong record to be building from in the basin. And I think it's a good model that we can use in other contexts as well. Appreciate appreciate being part of the these conversations. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. I just want to I just want to say thank you for the work that the Bureau has done in in trying to help in in an extraordinarily difficult uh, situation. Uh, I just I just what I'm really trying to call out though uh, is the is the very high probability that we are going to see this happen again and again uh, as we look into into this uh, very very water short future and so what i am am hoping that we will be able to do is address the endangered species act in a way i think you kind of alluded to it uh, when you said uh, you, you people are working together to try to figure out how to how to make these things work the the kind of all or nothing uh, zero sum game that we see in the Klamath though when it comes to water, I don't think is the proper future. Uh, I think the proper future is one where we figure out a way of trying to make sure everybody gets something in these situations as opposed to cutting everybody off uh, as did happen in the Klamath. And, and the reason I bring this up is because people are suffering so greatly from this. I mean, the, the damage, even, even notwithstanding your, your excellent efforts in trying to help people out, and so I'm just, I'm just saying that, th that that's why, the, why I welcome this conversation today because I see the same thing coming on the Colorado as we, as that we had to deal with uh, in the Klamath this year. And I'm just so wishing that we don't have to deal with it again. And I, forgive me for going on like this, but it's such an important thing uh, to the people uh, in my area and not only my area, but the Central Valley Project of California. So having said that, I'm gonna shift over to Chairwoman Flores for a second. Um, you mentioned, uh, Chairwoman, that, that the Colorado River Indian tribes have worked with stakeholders and the state of Arizona for over five years to develop the proposed legislation your testimony highlights. What, in your opinion, are the mer major barriers to, to actually having that, the, the content of that bill um, uh, happen? Um, the, the major barriers uh, for our legislation uh, bill is just to get every just to get everybody um, uh, on 
the same page. And we have done that. We have been um, uh, over the past five years uh, having meetings and um uh and and having a voice and not having a voice was one of the one of the barriers so now um we do have a voice and um uh stakeholders uh and other entities are recognizing us and they see our water uh, and our first priority water rights and they see that we have been participating in the um the pilot programs of following uh following our lands and we have been committed and have held our uh, end of the bargain, uh, bargain by keeping um, the, uh, uh, the water in Lake Mead with, with the pilot program and also with the DCP. Um, we um, were welcomed and um, uh, uh, to join in and be a part of the solution and, and not um, um, uh, uh, a hindrance in um, saving the river. The, and again, the river has always taken care of us. We need to take care of this river. And um, I think that that would have been, been about the, uh, uh, there are many other barriers, but that was one of the main barriers that, that we weren't recognized, our, uh, uh, our uh, water uh, allocations and, and were not recognized in um, viewing all and seeing that all the, um, the, the shortages. And so, we have something to offer. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And Mr. Chair, I, sadly, I didn't have my clock on. Do I have time left for another question? Well, you're a minute 18 into the red. Uh, so, <laughs> so the answer is no. <laughs> unfortunately, I, I have to say now, but we can uh, we can come back. Um, thank you. Th thank you, Ranking Member Benz, for your comments. And, and thanks for bringing up the dire conditions in the Klamath Basin, which we both represent. I know that the gentleman is aware that uh, everyone in the basin and every interest has been suffering. Uh, and uh, the downstream communities I represent and, and the species that you alluded to are, are also getting hammered. There are no big winners uh, in, in this uh, drought condition. So I, I did wanna uh, make that point. And uh, the chair will now recognize uh, Mr. Costa for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this important hearing and, and not only today, but next week. Uh, I think, um, uh, and, and you know, I've historically been involved in this from my days in the state legislature as chairman of the Ag and Water Committee, that water, the precious water resource that we all depend upon, I think is going to be one of the most pressing uh, challenges we face in the 21st century with climate change, not only for Western states, but for our entire country and the world. Um, it ultimately will determine whether or not we are amicably able to live and support a increased population, um, not only in, in our country, but around the world. Um, let me remind, and I think most of you know, uh, part of the challenge here as it relates to the Colorado River, uh, a river that was litigated for decades uh, when the final allocation was uh, resolved with the law of the river, um, it allocated seven and a half million acre feet of water to upper basin states and seven and a half million acre feet to lower basin states that includes Arizona, California, Nevada, and an additional one and a half million acre feet to Mexico. Uh, it was determined back then in the 60s in historical data that the average yield was about 16.4 million acre feet per year. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that that was over allocated. We know that today. Um, it's estimated that uh, water flows over the last two decades have continued to decline, averaging 12.4 million acre feet. So we've oversubscribed the river, and that's part of the challenge here. And the uh, Native Americans and the nation states that are represented here uh, clearly have an important um, uh, uh, requirement that they be afforded their water rights as well. Um, and we have folks that um, have um, have um, determined that they have rights to the river uh, that have yet to be resolved. Uh, and that's on top of what's already been uh, determined to be allocated. So we got uh, more demand and, and guess what? Uh, since the 1960s, all the Southwestern states, upper basin states and lower basin states have grown and more demands on that water. Uh, whether we're talking about um, New, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, California, uh, Colorado. And um, so how we deal with this conundrum uh, with climate change is uh, really the, the issue at hand. Um, 
so I have long sought and and um, I want to uh, uh, ask my question towards uh, questions for Mrs. Trujillo that we've got to use all the water tools in our water toolbox. In California, uh, we get water from a, a number of different sources, but one of the primary sources is the Colorado River Basin. Um, Ms. Trio, how does federal investment in our water infrastructure, uh, including improving conveyance, um, help California and the entire Western states become more resilient to climate change impacts on our water supplies? Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. The the muting comes from your guys, so we, we got it figured out. Thank you. As long as uh, the chairman gives me the 10 seconds that you were muted. <laughs> that's, a, that's a deal. Yeah, pretty generous. Uh, today, Jim. Th thank you, Representative Costa, for your for your leadership on these issues. And from a, from the federal perspective, the investments absolutely make a difference with respect to the water supplies. The, there is a strong connection between the stability that we're, we're seeking to achieve in the Colorado River Basin and the other sources of supply for, for California. That, that's a clear recognition um, that exists. Our infrastructure uh, proposals include investments in modernizing the aging infrastructure that we have in developing more water recycling and more innovative technologies to, to more efficiently use water and in basic investments in, in conservation throughout the basin. No, and, and I'm a big supporter of that. I've only got about 45 seconds left. I know you have your interagency drought relief working group and your national drought resilience partnership as a part of the water sub cabinet meeting. And, you know, we in California with our multiple sources are looking at ways and I'm working with the chairman uh, to better reinforce our own conveyance facilities and provide ability to reduce the amount of trans evaporation through the use of solar power and other means, because to the degree we can use these conservation tools, not only to improve our species, but improve water for our farms and our farm communities with these extreme drought conditions. Um, we'll talk more about the money, but I think in the, the next hearing, we I would like to know um, how you are going to through this various sub water sub cabinet effort allocate these funds and how we can work with you so all of the different states that are impacted by the Colorado River uh, including California uh, can participate in the allocation of these funds because they're desperately needed during the extreme droughts and I want to thank the uh, chairman and the uh, subcommittee chairman the full chairman uh, during the reconciliation period we were able to add another 500 million dollars for drought relief purposes and this is all important as we kind of work through this. Um, I thank the gentleman. And uh, I'm now told that Representative Gonzalez Colon will go next. Uh, Representative <coughs> Gonzalez, you recognize. Thank you, thank you uh, Chairman, for allowing me. I've been hearing the, 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 the witnesses. And first of all, I want to say thank you to all of them uh, for bringing this issue. and. Uh, even when I'm uh, part of the Eastern part of the Caribbean, uh, knowing what's happening in other parts of the states, it's important. I mean, all, all of us has uh, have our, our problems, and uh, I think the witnesses has illustrated uh, things that can can be achieved uh, by, by working together. Uh, so in that sense, I want to say thank you, but I want to yield my time uh, to Ranking Member uh, Benz. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh... Gonzalez Cologne for that yield and and uh, and I will make sure that I only utilize uh, two and a half minutes so I give my uh, overage back to the chair. Uh, but uh, the, a question uh, back to uh, Secretary Trio for just a moment. Many of the basin states noted the need for continued improvements to system modeling tools. What what is Reclamation doing in in that regard? Are you are you working on design of, of better tools to try to tell us uh, what we can anticipate and what we're going to do should shortfalls, um, further shortfalls occur. Thank you, Representative Bentz. We absolutely are continuing to work to develop the best available information that we can utilize for our own decision making but also to have available for the communities and the, the water managers around the West, including in the Colorado River Basin. 
We work closely with our other federal agencies at NOAA and the Weather Service and the Forecast Center to be able to have alignment in the, in the information we are providing. We have excellent technical staff at Reclamation who strive to, to communicate very effectively with the affected uh, folks that are working on these issues. Thank you. Thank you for that. And with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm going to yield back and I hope now we are even and, uh, and I'll, I'll stick with my five minutes the next time around. And thanks again to uh, Congresswoman Gagalas Colon for the yield. Uh, thank, I thank the gentleman and, and yet order is restored and, and uh, that is much appreciated. Um, I believe Mr. Soto uh, is next on our side. Uh, so the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Coming to you from what is generally Florida rich in water country, although our aquifer definitely has some stresses on it. We are very proud of the 8.3 billion uh, that's in the Build Back Better Act to help with Western water issues. And Chairman, I, I noticed that you needed a little extra time, so I wanted to yield to you if you would so want it the remainder of my time. Um, I wish you would yield some of your water to uh, California, but uh, whenever uh, you want to fund that cross nation pipeline of water from the east to west coast, we have more than enough, more than we want. But Mr. Soda, there are people there are people who still talk about that kind of thing. I, I don't think it's ever going to be feasible, but I appreciate the thought. Um, no, um, I, I do not have further questions in this round, so I appreciate it. Then I yield to Mr. Costa the remainder of my time, Mr. Very Chairman. Good. Mr. Costa, you're recognized. Thank you all very much, uh, Representative Soto, for that opportunity, and, and Mr. Chairman as well. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Trujillo, I'd like to get back to what I, what I was, uh, uh, area we were discussing earlier. In the fiscal appropriations for 2022, we have water related resources at 1.7 billion plus. Um, and uh, that only not only deals with the president's uh, request, but uh, additional funding from fiscal year 21. The total, I guess, comes to 1.95 um, when you add the numbers up. And then the bipartisan infrastructure bill would add to that another 5.35 billion, uh, 1.1 for water storage, 3.2 for aging infrastructure account, which I hope we can use some of those funds to deal with the challenges we have in California and repair uh, projects that are identified under reclamations assessment management report. And then for local communities, I mean, we have so many communities, whether they're Native American communities or small rural communities, whose water, uh, drinking water doesn't meet with state or federal standards. Uh, how quickly do you think are we going to get that, that money out? Uh, and of course, that doesn't mention the reconciliation monies that I spoke of earlier, and I don't know how much that's going to be, depending upon what happens with reconciliation, obviously. But uh, what's the strategy that uh, the Bureau has for dealing with getting these monies out as quickly as possible where it's most needed? I think you're muted. Thank again. you. Thank you very much for the support from Congress for these important issues and the uh, the short answer is that they are building upon our existing programs, so we have a very efficient way of getting the additional funding out to the communities. We're building upon the programs that we have. We have backlogs. We have additional requests for funding that we can easily cycle into, and I think that was uh, working cord in coordination by design for how some of this came together on purpose. Well, you know, part of that, uh, and, and the Bureau obviously has its challenges to be sure, but, you know, when we worked on uh, the settlement agreement on the San Joaquin River, as an example, um, we uh, allowed under that uh, uh, legislation that was signed into law, the ability for the Bureau to work with local water districts under the uh, thought that uh, they might be able to facilitate uh, and the uh, implementation of the funding in a more expedited fashion than the Bureau could, given the, the more cumbersome process you deal with. Have you looked at different ways in which you can deal that with local agencies uh, to you know, facilitate getting these, expediting these funds? We're always looking for that 
for ways to be more efficient. I think since January, we've already figured out how to allocate funding to over 220 different districts throughout the West. And I think that would work with Native Americans uh, groups as well, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. And tribes, absolutely. We have expanded our tribal technical support programs and have prioritized the ability to efficiently work with them in coordination with our other uh, partners here at Interior, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we're, we're trying to be as efficient as possible with these programs. Well, my time's almost expired, but I, I don't know if we can do it in next week's hearing or not, but it, I think it would be helpful for the subcommittee and the full committee, frankly, to get an idea of what is realistic to be expected in terms of what's already been allocated in the next fiscal year that can be actually moved out and and and, and in the next several years. So that would be helpful, I think, for all of us. The gentleman's Absolutely. time's expired. <clears throat> uh, the Thank chair now you. recognizes uh, Ms. Stansbury from New Mexico for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for convening today's important hearing, and thank you to all of our witnesses for joining us today. I'm especially proud to see so many New Mexicans here. As I often say, New Mexico's top exports are our green chili and our water experts, of which we have many here today, and so it's so great to have you all here today. As we know in New Mexico, El Lago es la vida, and it is part and parcel of our cultures and ways of life, our economy, and the future of our state. Assistant Secretary Trujillo, we're so proud to have you serving in this role and representing New Mexico. And Mr. Vigil, we're so grateful for your leadership at Hickoria and on the 10 Tribes Partnership. And of course, we're joined by our state engineer who's here today, Mr. D'Antonio. As a fellow New Mexico water nerd, I'm excited to have you all here today and to talk about the Colorado River and our other crucial watersheds in the West. As we all know, our rivers and communities have been gripped across the West by a drought this year, but our communities are no strangers to water scarcity as our tribes and Pueblos have lived on these lands since time immemorial and our acequia and land grant communities have shared waters across many, many generations. But it is clear that what we are seeing today is part of a much larger trend of a changing climate. As temperatures are getting hotter, our snowpack is declining, and we're seeing fundamental changes in our hydrologic systems. And nowhere is this more visible than in New Mexico, where our communities have faced historic drought conditions this year at the same time that our state has had the largest number of disaster declarations due to flooding and wildfires this year. So it's clear climate change is here and it is threatening the ability of our communities to bring water to our fields, to meet the needs of our tribes and pueblos, our acequias, our farmers and ranchers, and our rivers, which depend on these life-giving waters. While the Colorado River is being strained by these changes, we also are seeing historic partnerships in the basin, led by many of the panelists who are joining us here today, that are helping to bring transformational change to the management of this system. And these partnerships are crucial not only to the communities in the Colorado River, but to the Rio Grande Basin that flows through my district, which depends on water transfers from the Colorado to meet the needs of our communities and our endangered species. So as we look to the future and managing these river systems in a time of climate change, we need to continue to leverage these collaborative partnerships to invest in the best monitoring science and technology that we can to invest in modernizing our infrastructure and operational requirements and ensure that our communities have a seat at the table and are helping to direct the decisions that are made about those water systems. And I believe our job as lawmakers to, is to make sure that we are putting into place all of the changes that are necessary to empower our communities by passing transformational water policies, working to protect our tribes and pueblos, trust and treaty responsibilities and water rights, investing in our water management agencies, investing in resilient infrastructure as we're doing in the Build Back Better Act and Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, investing in our water science and data and technology and protecting those rivers. That is our charge as public servants and caretakers of these sacred waters. 
And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to use a little bit of my remaining time to ask Assistant Secretary Trujillo, you've worked across the West and the Colorado, the Rio Grande and many of our rivers for many, many years. Can you please share with us what you think Congress can do to help lift up the best of these collaborative watershed efforts and what we can do to best support your work? Thank you, Representative Stansberry, and uh, it makes me homesick to see you and Representative Fernandez there in Santa Fe or in New Mexico. I um, I think the the work that Congress is doing through the bipartisan infrastructure package is a great example of how that helps us do exactly what you uh, mentioned in your remarks. Where it allows us to improve our infrastructure, it allows us to do more recycling, to do more water planning and drought contingency planning efforts and support the existing programs that we have. And I think the underlying emphasis on sound science is exactly the way that we want to continue to be doing business in the Colorado River Basin and in a, a Westwide context as well. Thank you so much. And I see, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time, but if you'll indulge me, I just want to say I'm really grateful also that we have Mr. V. Hill here today, who is such an incredible resource on how we bring and make sure that our tribes have a seat at the table as we're directing and protecting our water rights for our tribes and our communities moving forward. So we're grateful to have you here today as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Representative Stansbury. And we're going to continue this um... New Mexico thread here by recognizing uh, Congresswoman Leger Fernandez for the next five minutes. Thank you, Thank you Chairman Huffman. Uh, are you getting an echo or am I all right? Um, I love the sound of your voice, but we're hearing it twice. Uh, let me try to switch that. Okay, is this better? Yeah, the audio. There you, you go. Sounds pretty clear. Okay, go great. right ahead. Sorry about that. I heard the okay. Thank you to our witnesses. Thank you for, you know, Agua Es Vida, Water is Life. Uh, earlier this year, I did an Agua Es Vida tour in my beautiful district where I heard from the Rio Chama Secchi Association, local farmers, the Carson National Forest, House Pueblo, and many more. And at each stop, local leaders told me about the impact declining water supplies and the climate crisis has on their communities. You know, something that resonated is Mr. B. Hill pointed out the importance of people uh, of tribes being talked to before things happen. You know, the Asequia users immediately below the Abiquiu Dam, which receives water from the Colorado, noted that they were never consulted when the dam was being planned and constructed. They noted how the dam's operation negatively impacts their irrigation canals and structures, you know, but they just weren't part of the conversation. Uh, Mr. B. Hill, in your testimony, um, you talked about um, uh, an idea, you named it the sovereign governance team, and, and that you thought it was very important that this be created when crafting future Colorado River agreements. Can you give us a really short synopsis of what a, a sovereign governance governance team look like? What do you want us to do? What should it look like, this consultation? Did I go mute again? No, it wasn't you, uh, Representative. It was me. I'm sorry. Thank oh. you so much for the question and thank you for the acknowledgement. And and yes, I mean, yeah, and it's really under, important to understand, Representative, that, you know, right now there is no formal institutionalized inclusion of the 30 tribal sovereigns into the policy making process as it exists. And so we have to rely on, on either our, our, you know, our state sovereign or the federal sovereign to represent our tribal water interests. And we've really built the foundation of understanding, I think, particularly in the Colorado River Basin, in terms of the absolute need for tribes to be at that sovereign table with the federal government and the state sovereign to, you know, to, 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 to make policy for the future of the Colorado River, because the current policy isn't inclusive of that formally. And no matter how much you want to engage in the conversation of inclusion, the structure doesn't allow for that right now. And so when we're talking about drought and drought response, you know, yes, we can be a part of that conversation and we, and it's in our DNA about how to live 
uh, sustainably and, and how to practice adaptive management in our, in our, through our culture. But you know, for us to, to be able to participate meaningfully as we should, you know, there needs to be a structure for engagement and there's not one that exists now. So no, why not use the template of something that was already created and have seems to be, have worked to a large extent in terms of creating a table for sovereigns to engage. And this will do a whole number of things in terms of forwarding policy in the Colorado River, where we need to start thinking about a culture and, and behaviors of, 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 of dealing with the less of a resource and how we're going to equitably apportion that resource, as it's already been stated. So thank you so very much. I wanted to get two quick questions in for our, our other Nuevo Mexicana. Um, you know, as you know, the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project runs through my congressional district. It helps the Hikari Apache Nation, Navajo City of Gallup, and other surrounding communities. Uh, and I'm going to uh, put this together with also other pipelines, because what we have is um, as those pipelines and finishing them has been delayed, and when we don't have the authorized spending level that is needed, um, we, we no longer have enough money. So I wanted to ask if you and the Bureau would be committed to work with me and the Hikari Apache Nation, the Navajo Nation, Gallup on amendments to the project's authorization so we can take advantage, um, not take advantage, we can make sure that we recognize the true costs. And also we are going to have to uh, make sure there's additional groundwater wells to supply communities until the project is complete. Um, so I'm hoping you'll be uh, open to working with us on getting that done. Thank you, Representative Fernandez. That project is near and dear to my heart and I've been working on it very closely for over 15 years. And we will be very happy to make sure you're um, staff and yourself are aware of all of the progress we have been making. And we've been working very closely with um, folks there in the region, at the Navajo Nation, and in the local communities to think creatively about how to make sure we can complete the effective components of the program. And if we uh, will be happy to work with technical work on technical support with your office and with others to make sure that we can make any adjustments that may be needed. But I was happy to participate in the groundbreaking ceremony for the Cutter Lateral, and then I'm looking forward to uh, being able to participate in the blessing ceremony because that, that portion of the pipeline has been completed. The managers did a great job of that construction and it will it is currently providing water to the communities who did not have it available previously. And it's a great example of, of the commitment from the Bureau of Reclamation and Department of the Interior of meeting the tribal needs in our various communities and in our home state of, of New Mexico. Thank you, Ms. Trejo. Thank the you. Gentle ladies, time has expired. The chair now recognizes the, the chairman of the full committee, Representative Grijalpa from Arizona. First of all, uh, thank uh, Chair Flores for her uh, her, her comments and, and her, her kind remarks, uh, very much appreciated. And uh, as, as uh, the chairwoman knows, uh, we're, all of us are very much aware in Arizona of the uh, significant contribution the tribe made uh, to accomplishing that portion of the drought contingency plan. And uh, so, uh, and many thank yous. Uh, let me follow up on something that, that uh, uh, Chairman Huffman was asking. Uh, the comments, the comments you hear about if you throw out NEPA, you throw out uh, endangered species, if you throw out other uh, environmental protections, air quality, water quality, that yeah, the drought will be resolved. That's not true. That's uh, it's not even a false choice. It's just not true. And so I uh, I ask this because I think it's very important about utilization and usage going forward. And uh, as you put together, as you and and, and the council uh, put together the leasing proposal, uh, would, is the lease going to prioritize uh, water leases that help deal with the deficit that we have in the Colorado River? Is that 
Is that the uh, primary focus of it, if I may ask? It's not. It's your prerogative to put in there what you uh, what you want, Madam Chair, and I, I acknowledge that and respect that. But my question is: is is that is that something that's that's is a consideration? Do we have the chairwoman? No. Thank you for the question, uh, uh, Chairman Grijalva. We want our sovereignty uh, protected to use our water as we decide. Right now, we, we don't have that um, that authority to use the water, uh, um, and we're seeking to lease our water. Um, we can you only use our, our our water on our our lands, our farmlands. Um, um, but our but our tribal members um, decided in a referendum that they do not want to make multi generational commitments of our water for new development. We are finally free from the long term BIA land leases and do not want our water to be committed to the same in the same way. We are committed to saving the river and helping our neighbors and overall environment. So we want the authority to decide again for ourselves how to use our water. Um, which is the same authority yeah. other tribes in Arizona yeah. have, and, and I, we and have I the of water to do so. And I respect that, and and trust me, I respect that. But in this process, this legislative process, uh, I I'm, I'm asking a question that I think is inevitable, and I think that's further discussions that Chairman Huffman and I and can have with with uh, with your leadership uh, and yourself, Madam Chair. And again, thank you uh, for what you doing for Arizona and thank you very much for your kind comments. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Mr. Rahil, 12 tribes in the Colorado River Basin still don't uh, have unresolved water rights uh, claims. Why is that resolution uh, and uh, we need that resolution to quantify the water rights for the tribes, not only for themselves, but I think for the whole basin. Uh, talk about that. It's not us more of a statement than a question, but uh, what I mean is that that's pretty obvious. Those those have to be closed. Mr. McHill? Mr. Vahil, you're muted. Sorry about that, Chairman Huffman. Um, I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, incredibly uh, good question in terms of the the, the, the tribes in the basin who, have, who don't have quantified or haven't settled their water rights yet. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the structural deficit that's going on, the supply demand imbalance, and it becomes a, a real part yeah. of the conversation because where's that water going to come from in, in, in that particular climate because that tribe absolutely yeah, has a right to that water. And it has a right to water to, to, for, for domestic uses, even paramount to, you know, just a settlement, you know, and so it becomes really important that we start to, for certainty in the base and not only recognize that those that tribal rights yeah. that are quantified, but those that are unquantified because those have to be included into the conversation. Thank you. Uh, right. Certainty, I think is the key word that, that you use and, and, and this is critical to that certainty uh, for the basin. Um, if I may, Mr. Alvin, one, one question, uh, you know, for uh, Mr. Hill. When, when we've heard from the tribal nations today about being at the table, and it's absolutely correct. With 25% of the resource, there has to be, a, they have to be at the table, not only proportionally, but with, 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 with equity. But um, in the past, the table has been dominated uh, by, uh, by users uh, whose interests are more on the on the business commercial side, and how, how not only the integration of tribes, but how are we creating a balance in in the in the future drought management plans after 2026? How are we going to create that balance? Um, you know? Yeah, first you have to by you have to acknowledge. This is for Mr. Hill, Mr. Hill. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. V Hill as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we we at Interior 
recognize the importance of involvement of our tribes and have been working very closely and through several forums, some of them involved that Mr. V. Hill's involved, like the Water and Tribes Initiative and the 10 Tribes Partnership. We also have a technical discussion going on with regular conversations throughout the basin with our tribes. And then in Arizona, the Intertribal uh, mm -hmm. Forum allows us m multiple opportunities for, for interactions. And then we, we think going forward, we're going to have to be as inclusive as possible in all of the seven states with respect to the state representatives, the local community, the nonprofit organizations, the very, very broad group of interested people who are depending on the Colorado River and will need to be part of our discussions going forward. Thank you. It's the, the, the when this was created, uh, the the interests of the West were different. This is a different West, and, and, and there's many different constituencies and voices that uh, need to be heard in, in the development of those plans. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I know that as Mr. Vahil was uh, attempting to chime in, he was going to remind us that he had suggested the Columbia River uh, Basin as a potential model as an answer, I, I, I'm sure, um, to your question. So I, I appreciate his testimony Thank and you. everyone. Uh, in our panel of federal and tribal witnesses. We're gonna move on now to a second panel. Um, I would like to remind the second panel witnesses to please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Uh, of course, the flip side of that is please unmute yourself when we need you to speak. We're uh, continually reminded of that, that side of it as well. But I will allow the witnesses to all finish their testimony before we bring it back to members for questions. And I will now introduce our second panel. So today we have the governors representing all of the seven states of the Colorado River Basin with us to present testimony. We'll first hear from um, the governor's representatives, rather. Uh, now we won't have all seven governors themselves, but we will have representatives from all seven of those governors. And we'll hear first from uh, Mr. Thomas Bushatsky, uh, director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources. The chair now recognizes Mr. Bushatsky for five minutes. And you are muted, Mr. Bushatsky. Okay, we're gonna try to fix the audio. Let's give this just a moment. We can uh, we can have uh, Mr. Peter Nelson from the Colorado River Board of California uh, ready on deck if if we can't get the audio fixed for Mr. Pushatsky. Chairman Hoffman, can you hear me now? There you go. We've got you loud and clear. So thank you for providing me an opportunity to testify today on behalf of the state of Arizona. I have also submitted written testimony. A 20-year drought and climate change have had devastating impacts on the Colorado River. In 2022, Arizona will lose 18% of its total Colorado River entitlement. Impacts to agriculture, tribes, and municipal water users will result, but Arizonans have come together to provide financial resources and wet water to partially mitigate those impacts. The likelihood of future deeper cuts is high, and in 2023, Arizona may lose an additional 80,000 acre feet and mitigation for those reductions is unlikely. In August, projections of Lake Mead levels triggered a consultation provision in the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan. The robust actions we have taken to date are not enough. Arizona, Nevada, and California have been meeting and are looking to do more. Additional actions to protect Lake Mead fall into two categories, mandatory cuts or additional conservation. Arizona's goal is conservation and not greater cuts. Tribal and non-tribal partnerships will achieve that goal. Over the last two decades, we have learned valuable lessons for managing the Colorado River. And they include, first, be vigilant in monitoring the hydrology and projected reservoir elevations. We must have data and modeling products produced by the Bureau of Reclamation who possess the best available science. Two, achieve outcomes to equitably share the benefits and risks attendant to the Colorado River system. Three, adhere to, the, to an ethic of collaboration 
among the states, Mexico, the United States, tribes, and other stakeholders. Four, recognize that we are connected from Wyoming to the Sea of Cortez. Five, incentivize actions that conserve water in Lake Mead. Six, resources from the United States and its agencies must be tools in the toolbox. And seven, continue state participation in formal discussions with Mexico. As I mentioned, Arizona tribes are key stakeholders in Colorado River management. A healthy river is critical to tribal water rights settlements. Arizona has 11 of its 22 tribes with rights yet to be determined in whole or in part. Uncertainty attached to climate change impacts on the flow of the river and to the post 2026 operating criteria further complicate completion of settlements. But it is important to the state that those tribal claims be settled. In conclusion, drought and climate change are presenting challenges that are likely to increase over time. Proper planning, management, robust conservation, and collaboration across political jurisdictions and among stakeholders create the greatest likelihood for success today and in the future. And I thank you again, and I stand ready to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Pashetsky. Um, we'll now go to Peter Nelson. He is the California uh, chairman of the Colorado River Board. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Nelson, and I am the chair chairman of the uh, Colorado River Board of California and California's Colorado River Commissioner. I'd like to thank the subcommittee on water, oceans, and wildlife, Chairman Huffman, ranking, ranking member Bance, uh, Chairman Grijalva, and the other members of the committee for holding this hearing at a time of historic drought. Regardless of why the climate has changed, the record is clear. Less than average precipitation is resulting in miserable runoff, aridification, causing lake levels to plummet, putting 40 million Americans at risk, environmental havoc, and food production peril. The Colorado River Board of California represents the collective interest of Colorado River water users in our state. We protect the rights and interest of California's water and hydropower resources. We provide peer-to-peer -peer relationships in collaborative interstate discussions with the other six basin states, the federal government, tribes, and Mexico. California is also experiencing drought with equal, if not greater severity. Allocations for the state water project contractors in 2021 are just 5%. The Department of Water Resources is signaling contractors to expect an initial 0% allocation, needing a snowpack of 140% just to get a normal runoff. And for the first time ever, Orville Dam is now unable to produce power due to low reservoir levels. Pre-1914 water rights holders were issued orders to stop diversions. On the brighter side, California has stepped up in 2003 with the quantification settlement agreement to reduce Colorado River uses by 800,000 acre feet annually and included mitigation measures for the Salton Sea. We achieved and exceeded conservation through the 2007 shortage criteria and 2019 drought contingency plan. So Metropolitan has 1.3 million acre feet of storage in Lake Mead adding 14 feet of elevation. Imperial Irrigation District, Coachella Valley Water District have conserved and Palo Verde has a successful following program with partners in Arizona, Nevada, and the Bureau of Reclamation. Additionally, Met Metropolitan, Nevada, Arizona, and Reclamation are currently collaborating on a large scale recycling project in the Los Angeles Basin this has the potential to create 150,000 acre foot annually of water for the region, reducing demand on the Colorado River. Naturally, with the largest share of California's river use, a target will be the Imperial Irrigation District. Imperial has already participated in the largest ag to urban transfer in the country through the quantification settlement agreement. Any additional water conservation programs will need to, of course, have their concurrence and need to address the Salton Sea mitigation. California is collaborating with our sister states in the basin. 
Native American tribes who need access to clean and reliable water and be part of the process. Federal agencies, colleagues in Mexico in developing the next set of Colorado River system operating guidelines to be put in place in 2026. We are responding with all hands on deck to the reconsultation requirements under the DCP 1030 elevation trigger in collaboration with these partners. We urge the committee to support and provide funding for partnerships invar involving large scale regional recycling projects, system conservation programs, salt and sea mitigation, and water quality improvements, including addressing salt reductions from the Paradox Valley unit. It will only be through collaboration and cooperation among all of us stakeholders in the basin that will have any chance of meeting these challenges and we will need the United States to be involved in these efforts. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this statement and I look forward to addressing any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, the committee will now hear from Mr. John Ensminger, the general manager of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Mr. Ensminger, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Benz, Representative Napolitano, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation today. My name is John Ensminger, and I serve as general manager of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. It is not news to this subcommittee that the unprecedented hydrologic conditions on the Colorado River have left both Blake's Powell and Mead at critically low elevations. The math problem we face is simple. If we rely upon the promises of the 1920s and the 1940s, there are legal entitlements to 17.5 million acre feet of water each year. Annual, annual use today is approximately 14 million acre feet. And over the last 20 years, the river has given us an average of 12.3 million acre feet. Despite fervent warnings from the scientific community that in the face of climate change, we must plan for a future with even less than 12.3 million acre feet, there is not yet anything approaching consensus within the river community as to how dry of a future we should plan for. And while this panel was asked to talk about drought, there's more and more evidence on the ground that what the Colorado River is actually facing is not drought, but aridification and a permanent transition to a drier future. If we are to build upon the river's many successes over the last 25 years, we must confront the magnitude of the challenge in front of us and quickly reach agreement on what future scenarios we're willing to plan for. But defining the problem is only the first step. We must develop additional supplies, pursue aggressive conservation, and make investments in technologies and tools that show promise in helping us achieve both. The agricultural and municipal uh, sectors must work together, uh, and to that end, research is underway to test the effectiveness of drip irrigated alfalfa projects in Arizona. But the learning is slow, and the pace of engagement between urban and agricultural water users must be accelerated. As we work on our long-term goals, we must also recognize that the only near-term management strategy for protecting critical lake meat elevations is reducing use. Southern Nevada has invested billions of dollars in water conservation and infrastructure, but Nevada represents a mere 1.8% of the river's allocated flows. Continued efficiency must become a commonplace philosophy throughout the basin. We must also develop additional supplies. Metropolitan's regional reuse project represents a long-term supply option for the lower basin, and we continue to urge the passage of the Large-Scale Water Recycling Project Investment Act. Cooperative regional projects of this kind represent the best hope for adding new supplies into the lower basin. Our progress towards sustainable solutions depends on partnership and well-coordinated action. But the river community is at a crossroads. We have a simple but difficult decision to make. Do we double down on the promises of the last century and fight about water that simply isn't there? Or do we roll up our sleeves and deal with the climate realities of this century? Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ensminger. 
Uh, up next is Ms. Rebecca Mitchell, the director of the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Ms. Mitchell, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Huffman and members of the um, subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Becky Mitchell, director of the Colorado Water Conservation Board. And as director of our state's water policy agency and Colorado's negotiator on the Colorado River, I want to share my insights on the impacts of drought in Colorado and upper basin state and the factors that impact our relative water supply security from an interstate perspective. The entire Colorado basin has been impacted by drought, but those impacts have been felt differently in the upper basin and lower basin because of where Lakes Mead and Powell sit. Both of these large reservoirs are above lower basin water users uses and below upper basin uses. Having these large reservoirs above them has meant the lower basin has had some certainty in their water deliveries. In fact, the lower basin states have never faced shortages to their deliveries from Lake Mead and will not until 2022. In contrast, the upper basin, um, in the upper basin, we have taken shortages nearly every year for over 20 years. Without that large reservoir upstream, we are reliant on current runoff from snowpack. It is for that this reason that the upper basin use it, uses are variable. When snowpack is abundant, water is available for use. But when the snow is thin, water is not there and our water users go without. A perfect example of the impacts of climate change. Colorado has suffered from consecutive years of low stream flows. Perpetual dry soil conditions have increased absorption of snow melt and reduced spring runoff. This year has been especially difficult. 90% of the state is currently experiencing drought. An example of the difficult situations that Coloradans are dealing with, a major storage project in southwestern Colorado received only one tenth of its water allocation this year. And due to the compounding years of shortages, people across the state are considering heartbreaking decisions like selling multi generational family farms. These decisions have significant psychological, sociological, and economic impacts to the communities. The water shortages facing Southwest Colorado the last two years fell heavily on the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, whose economy and communities depend on revenue generated from crop production. On top of these impacts of drought, releases made from Blue Mesa Reservoir recently also impacted the lo local recreational economy. These releases were made by the Bureau of Reclamation pursuant to the eminent need provision of the Drought Response Operations Agreement, part of the 2019 Drought Contingency Plan. These were also, there were also releases from New Mexico and Wyoming. The dry, dry soil conditions and warmer temperatures have also left our forests more vulnerable to fire. The summer of 2020 brought record breaking fires, including three of the largest wildfires in Colorado's history. In total, over 650,000 acres were burned and hundreds of homes were destroyed. We are still dealing with the aftermath of those fires, including catastrophic mudslides. With little vegetation to hold the soil in place and prevent erosion, heavy rainstorms brought roughly 65,000 tons of mud and debris down the slopes, closing Interstate 70 for 17 straight days. It's important for me as commissioner of the Headwater State to make sure everyone whose work impacts the Colorado River understands the challenges that Coloradans face, particularly as we implement the 2019 drought contingency plans and consider the negotiation of the post 2026 operations of the major reservoirs. As we look forward to the, those negotiations, one critical element will be meaningful engagement with the tribal nations in the Colorado Basin. Speaking as Colorado's commissioner, I talk to the representatives of the Southern Ute and the Ute Mountain Ute tribes regularly, sovereign to sovereign. I am proud to say Colorado has um, water rights settlements with both of those tribes, but we must understand that each tribe is different with different needs, values, histories, and relationships. Negotiators in each, each state should take the time to sit down with each tribe in their state to understand their unique, unique positions and needs. 
It will also be important to recognize that since not everything can be addressed through these operational guidelines, that we must also support initiatives that recognize the urgent need to ensure tribes have access to clean drinking water. In addition to supporting initiatives, providing funding for infrastructure to access clean drinking water for tribes, Colorado also supports ongoing efforts to fully fund implementation of the drought contingency plan, investments in agricultural sustainability and efficiency, and recovery programs in the upper basin, including through House Resolution 5001. My discussions with folks across the state of Colorado, including tribal representatives, stakeholders, NGOs, and all types of water users, have helped me develop some principles that will remain in the forefront of my mind through the upcoming negotiations. I believe all of those here today can stand behind two of those goals. First, we must continue the spirit of interstate collaboration and cooperation that has defined the work in the basin for 100 years. Secondly, we must provide water supply security and certainty for all in the lower basin, the upper basin, and the 40 million people who rely on this critical resource. We are committed to being a part of the solution that works for all of the Colorado River Basin. Thank you, and I um, will be available for questions. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. We will now hear from Mr. John D'Antonio, the state engineer for the state of New Mexico. Uh, Mr. D'Antonio, you recognized. Chairman we are not getting audio uh, from you, unfortunately, Mr. D'Antonio. And I, I don't think you're muted. Let's let's try again. Can you hear me? Is any better? It's pretty faint. Um, can, can you try to give us a little test here? Uh, can you hear me now? Um, let's keep working on that. Can we come back to you, Mr. D'Antonio? I think if we can, we should jump ahead to Mr. Gene Shawcroft, uh, general manager of the Central Utah Water Conservation District, and then we will come back to Mr. D'Antonio when we can get a, get a little better volume level for him. So, Mr. Shawcroft, if you're with us, you're recognized. Good afternoon um, to all. Thank you for conducting this hearing. Uh, Chairman Huffman, rank, Ranking Member Bentz, and members of the Subcommittee. My name is Gene Shawcroft, and I serve as Utah's Upper Colorado River Commissioner and General Manager for the Central Utah Water Conservancy District. The district is the state sponsor of the Central Utah Project and is also the largest diverter of Colorado River water in Utah. The Colorado River provides over one third of Utah's water supply and is fundamental to its prosperity. With such reliance on the river, the unprecedented drought in main stem reservoir storage and river flows is alarming. On March 17th, Governor Cox declared a state of emergency due to drought conditions and urged all Utahns to use less water. The effectiveness of Utah's statewide drought response is promising. Over this time last year, we have reached reductions as high as 32%. As general manager, I have also overseen the implementation of the largest water conservation program of Colorado River water in Utah. Section 207 of the Central Utah Project Completion Act statutorily requires us to conserve up to 80,000 acre feet annually by 2033. We are conserving nearly 140,000 acre feet, 50% more than what our statutory requirement. Additional work must be done. Nowhere is this more important than in the Colorado River Basin. We know that extreme conditions like this year will become more frequent, further straining a river system that is reaching a breaking point. The Upper Basin Drought Contingency Plan includes a commitment by the upper division states to evaluate the feasibility of a temporary, voluntary, and compensated demand management program to reduce consumptive use. In addition, the Drought Response Operating Agreement is also being actively implemented in the Upper Basin. This agreement governs the release of storage water upstream of Lake Powell once operational adjustments have been considered at Lake Powell. 
releases from these upper reservoirs are underway as we speak, as has been mentioned. Also, as Ms. Mitchell mentioned, the upper basin has routinely taken shortages, which are measured by the significant reductions in water that is available for use by our system. Like others, we face challenges in supplying water to a state with explosive growth, even as the supply diminishes. Overcoming these challenges is a tall order we must tackle together with the inclusion of all Colorado River stakeholders. Utah is committed to the development and use of new technology to aid in forecasting and measurement of diversions, use, and depletions. One particularly important platform using remote sensing for measurement of depletions is OpenET. Continued, continued congressional support of such work, especially as it shifts from the research to application arena is necessary. Further use of such tools will allow for consistent demonstration it, excuse me, consistent determination of depletions across all Colorado River Basin states. Congressional support for rural water infrastructure investment, conservation programs, outreach, education, and additional research is also critical. I grew up on a small farm in Colorado. As a boy, my favorite day was the day the snowmelt began and water was turned into the canals. Water in the canals meant we could eat, buy things, and live comfortably. I learned early on that water is finite, shared, and a common resource. When, I, when it comes to the Colorado River, the most effective solutions for the future must be collaborative. Each of the basin states is bound together by a common goal, which is to utilize this precious water resource in a responsible way that honors governing law and allows us to meet the needs and priorities of our communities. Thank you again for the opportunity to share this information and be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shawcroft. Let's go back to uh, Mr. D'Antonio and see if we can ha um, hear him now. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, yeah. Mr. D'Antonio, I don't know what to say. We, we are just not able to hear you. Um, and so, unfortunately, while we can keep trying to work on that, we're going to have to have your written testimony suffice for the time being. Uh, and if we can, if we can troubleshoot the the audio, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, I'm sure we'd like to include you in in the questioning. Um, but given that problem, uh, we will now uh, hear from Ms. Mr. Pat Terrell uh, from Wyoming, Commissioner to the Upper Colorado River Commission. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Bentz, and members of the subcommittee. Um, am I being heard? Yes. You sound okay. great. Thanks for checking. <laughs> well, thank you. I, uh, With Mr. D'Antonio's problem, I thought I would check. I am Patrick Terrell, Wyoming's Commissioner to the Upper Colorado River Commission and Wyoming's uh, Governor's Representative on the Colorado River. Thank you for providing the opportunity to present testimony today on behalf of the state of Wyoming. You've heard much already today about conditions at Lake Mead and Lake Powell, but drought impacts are not limited to the major system reservoirs. Water users in Wyoming, like other upper basin states, continue to experience significant water shortages due to the extremely dry conditions. We in Wyoming, uh, as in other places, rely on snowmelt and whatever runoff is available on the rivers and streams. When the water supply is not sufficient to supply all water rights, only the earliest and most senior water rights get satisfied. Therefore, like our other upper basin states, our users have routinely also suffered shortages. Even though Wyoming has developed less than two thirds of its compact apportionment under a full supply. During drought years, Wyoming water use is reduced by more than 20% compared to years when water is more plentiful. These shortages get little attention and require no federal declaration, but they happen nevertheless and carry with them attendant economic impacts. Collaboration will continue to be the key in responding to drought since before 2000. The basin states, Reclamation, Mexico, 
Basin tribal leaders, NGOs, water users, and others have collaborated to implement unprecedented, innovative, and proactive measures. As the challenges increase, that collaboration must not only continue, but improve. We intend to continue that coordination as we develop post-2026 reservoir operating rules. However, post-2026 guidelines cannot address all of the numerous issues and impacts caused by this drought. Many can only be addressed by other response measures. The Upper Basin will continue to implement the 2019 Drought Contingency Plan, the principal goal of which was to assure continued compliance with the 1922 Compact. Further, releasing storage from upstream federal reservoirs, as you just heard about from Mr. Shawcroft, is only a first line of defense to protect critical elevations at Lake Powell. Existing storage is finite and cannot protect that lake under many of the dry scenarios now being projected. If such a program is even feasible, in addition, any upper basin demand management program still faces difficult challenges to be resolved before it can be developed and implemented. More is needed to help ensure the basin drought resilience. The most immediate needs include ensuring the federal commitments under the DCP can be met, securing access to clean water for tribal communities, and securing authorization and long-term funding for species recovery programs. There is a real need to focus on a broad range of investments and opportunities, including water storage infrastructure, advancing large-scale augmentation, facilitating system conservation, promoting watershed health, promoting forest restoration and management, improving ag operations, incentivizing municipal conservation and improving water supply forecasting. The effects of this historic drought extend from the headwaters in Colorado and Wyoming through each upper and lower basin state and into Mexico. Drought response measures must equally stretch across the entirety of the basin. Success will require development and implementation across federal agencies in cooperation and partnership with the basin states, the tribes, our water users, NGOs, and other stakeholders. Wyoming is ready and willing to engage in that collaborative effort necessary to build and sustain water resiliency throughout the basin and to provide more information on the types of investments and opportunities most likely to help ensure the Colorado River Basin continues to support a thriving economy and a healthy environment. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I will remain and be happy to answer any questions the, you or the committee may have. Mr. Terrell, thanks very much. Uh, we're going to move on to questions of the members right now. If we can figure out the problem with Mr. D'Antonio's microphone, we'll take him out of order and come back to him. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to recognize myself for the first uh, set of questions. And I'd like to begin with Mr. Nelson from California. Mr. Nelson, uh, we spoke in the previous panel a little bit about the Salton Sea restoration. This, of course, is a a partnership uh, that is being led by the state of California, but it includes tribes and local partners, environmental stakeholders and federal agencies. Could you please just expand on why federal support of those partnerships and their restoration work is so important, uh, not just for those living uh, near the Salton Sea, but really for the larger Colorado River Basin community? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Huffman, uh, for the um, Congressman Huffman for the question. It's a great question. Um, the Salton Sea is uh, historically a, uh, a delta uh, part of the Colorado River, and it's it is important to the region of Southern California. Um, first, the work that is being done now at the Salton Sea is associated with uh, a continued implementation of the 2003 Quantification Settlement Agreement which resulted in nearly uh, 500,000 acre foot of conserved water supply that are then transferred to the coastal plain. And so uh, that's an important aspect of water management in California. Secondly, the sea is a critical element of the Pacific Flyway. You have the Sunny Bono uh, Refuge there. Uh, it houses uh, as other areas, resident and migratory bird species, or are important for ecological values there. 
thirdly, uh, as the inflows to the sea have decreased since 2003, uh, mitigated by uh, the QSA, and well as increased irrigation efficiencies within the Imperial Irrigation District, the exposed playa continues to expand and it's resulting in a significant public health threat associated with blowing dust. It's my understanding that the Imperial Valley contains some of the highest uh, childhood asthma rates and other pulmonary uh, health issues. This air quality impact is a social and environmental uh, issue that is uh, critical to the region, uh, not only to the Imperial Valley, but across the Mexicali Valley uh, into the southwestern Arizona and eastern Riverside County. And finally, um, I would say it's worth acknowledging that the commitments for collaboration and partnerships contained in the August uh, 2016 MOU between the Obama administration and the state of California. That MOU committed the state and the, and the federal government to uh, for long-term coordinations and a series of uh, tasks that would be accomplished, including an initial outlay of $20 million for habitat restoration and dust suppression, um, and $10 million for state managed uh, monitoring at the sea. Um, California suggests that this MOU should be considered basically as a foundation for our collaboration uh, in the area. Uh, we have the Salton Sea mitigation plan that the state is working through and actually making some good progress on now. All right, thank you, Mr. Nelson. Uh, Mr. Ensminger, uh, in the time I have left, I'd like to talk about this large scale water recycling um, potential, the vision uh, for bringing a new drought proof source of water to, you know, this vexing shortage challenge we face in the Colorado uh, basin. Could you speak a little bit about why adding something like that to the region's water supply portfolio would be so critically important and also um, the state of play in terms of federal support for these large scale water recycling projects. Are we doing enough? Should we be doing more? Uh, you have the rest of my time. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Huffman. Um, first, just the, the water impact. Uh, the, the Metropolitan Project could add as much as 160,000 acre feet of water to the system. Uh, and Met's been uh, very gracious in, in agreeing to partner with Southern Nevada and Central Arizona to, to make that into a regional project with regional uh, benefits. Uh, I, I do think more projects like that are available. And as we move into the future, we really have to look at all water within this basin as water that's precious and available for use, be those storm waters or the wastewater that, that Southern California is currently discharging into the Pacific Ocean. All of that water can be utilized uh, to solve the, the daunting problems in, in front of us. In terms of the federal government, there is, I believe, $450 million contained in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which would be very uh, good to, to get that across the finish line and additional funds uh, within the reconciliation bill uh, that would also be used not just for uh, water reclamation, uh, but also for federal compliance with their obligations under the DCP. Thank you. All right, I appreciate that very much. Um, Ranking Member Bentz is next up for questions, um, but I'm told that we may have finally achieved an audio connection with Mr. D'Antonio, so we want to give all seven basin states equal time, uh, and, and I promised I would bring him in out of order. So, Mr. D'Antonio, let, let's see if we can hear you, and if Mr. Bentz uh, is willing to just stand down for a few minutes, we'll, we'll come right back to him after you. So, Mr. D'Antonio. I'm on my telephone. And we can hear you. Fantastic. Okay, great. okay. Uh, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Bentz, Representative Ledger Fernandez, and Representative Sansbury from New Mexico, distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is John D'Antonio. I'm the state engineer for New Mexico and Governor Lujan Grisham's representative on the Colorado River Compact. I very much appreciate your patience today and the opportunity to appear before you to provide comments and updates on behalf of the state of New Mexico regarding the current issues and priorities related to the Colorado River Basin. First, upper basin shortages. In the 19 
1922 Colorado River Compact, the seven Colorado River Basin states agreed to share the Colorado River with each basin apportioned the exclusive beneficial consumptive use of seven and a half million acre feet of water per year. New Mexico's apportionment is 11.25% of that amount. And since 2000, the Colorado River Basin has entered a period of continued drought. The upper division states have been taking shortages based on limited supply for the past two decades. In New Mexico, water shortages occur annually in the San Juan River Basin, including the Animas and La Plata tributaries. The San Juan Chama project, a major trans-basin diversion project authorized by Congress in 1962 to deliver San Juan water to New Mexico's municipalities and pueblos along the Rio Grande has experienced significant variability in water supply, particularly during the last decade. And as an example, in 2021, we experienced a shortage of, of 40%. One key component of the Upper Basin uh, Drought Contingency Plan is the Drought Response Operation Agreement, known as DROA. In June 2021, reclamation projected that Lake Powell may fall below the critical elevation of 3525 in less than six months. And under the emergency provision of the DROA, reclamation in coordination with the Upper Division states um, started releasing 181,000 acre feet this year from three main reservoirs in the Upper Basin to help boost the elevation of Lake Powell. Reclamation and the upper division states are currently working on a plan framework that will fully address the state's key issues and concerns prior to any future drill operations. Authorized projects in the basin states. One of the original intents of the 1956 Colorado River Storage Project Act was to allow the upper division states to fully develop their apportionment. Uh, upper basin states have not. New Mexico's upper basin water use is currently about half of its apportionment. Most of New Mexico's future development plans in the upper basin or for tribal water development pursuant to the Indian water rights settlements that have already been authorized by Congress, such as the 2009 Navajo Gallup water supply project, which is vital in providing sustainable residential water to the rural com communities within and around the Navajo Nation, the Hickory Apache Nation, and the city of Gallup. Those communities have been hit particularly hard by the drought and the COVID-19 pandemic. When using or analyzing the existing climate trends, both prolonged dry periods and punctuated wet periods should be taken into consideration. The system will need to be addressed not only for a worse droughts than we have experienced today, but also for short and wet periods from an infrastructure and public health and safety standpoint. It will be important to address the existing short and long-term challenges with a long-term equitable approach while retaining the flexibility for the states to develop their authorized amounts particularly during the good years. Striking such a desired balance, however, is no easy task. The 2007 interim guidelines will expire in 2026, affect over 40 million people in seven states. The upper and lower Colorado regional offices of the Bureau of Reclamation have staff with relevant modeling ex expertise who can assist the basin states with responding to our short-term priorities, i.e. modeling, refinements, and needs related to the DCP's implementation. Long-term priority, which is the post-2026 operations of Lakes Powell and Mead. We would request additional financial resources for reclamation to support the basin states in the next one to five years. New Mexico supports the Build Back Better Act and the Reclamation Settlement Fund for Indian Water Rights Settlements, which is really an investment in our future, as well as the HR 5001, which is the Upper Colorado and San Juan River Basins Recovery Act. In conclusion, in 1922, the seven basin states agreed to the terms of the compact on the basis that it represented a fair apportionment for the resource and that it protected rights for each of those signatories. For almost a century, the states have worked cooperatively with, with each other and the federal government and the Republic of Mexico and other partners and stakeholders to manage the systems and implement necessary adaptive management actions within the confines of the law of the river. Future decisions decision-making process should consider science and legal and policy aspects concurrently. I'm confident that all seven basin states will strive to employ a fact-based approach that considers the holistic vision. Thank you. Mr. D'Antonio, thank you for your technical perseverance. And uh, <laughs> Ranking Member Benz, uh, thank you for your forbearance. Uh, you're up. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to start with uh, Mr. Tyrell from Wyoming. Uh, you mentioned, Mr. Tyrell, watersheds and uh, forest restoration. 
as something that uh, things that need to happen here in Oregon. We agree with you completely that uh, watersheds are an absolutely essential part of our water systems and that forest restoration is an absolutely essential activity. But sadly, uh, we can't seem to get into the forest. And uh, it, there's a prohibition almost upon cutting down a tree or trying to remove junipers or other things that would actually help dramatically in improving the watershed and our water supply. Uh, um, it's the craziest thing when we all know that good things can happen if we can get into the forest, but we can't seem to get there. So my question to you is the same thing happening in Wyoming, and if so, what are you doing about it? Thank you for the uh, the question, um, Representative Bentz. Uh, I don't know that I can speak uh, greatly to Wyoming's forests right now, other than um, uh, and access to them. We we have also been uh, not quite like Oregon this year, but the victim of fires in recent years. The Mullen fire last year west of Laramie was horrible, and uh, in my view, uh, as we if we're interested in hydrologic health of forests and rivers, um, that points backward to a healthy forest. Whether it's uh, remo removing fuels or just having healthy growth, um, forests are valuable for the water they can hold in the winter in terms of snow uh, and in maintaining uh, many riparian and stream flow areas for both the environment and for people to rely on the water. So it would seem to me that uh, looking at forest health uh, can do nothing but help uh, our conditions on the river. Thank you. And uh, shifting to uh, Ms. Mitchell from Colorado, uh, there's a lot of talk and a lot of reference to collaboration and uh, conservation and words like that, uh, pretty general. Uh, what I would be interested in knowing is if there's a study has been done in your state to determine, first of all, what sort of conservation might actually be available and, and if implemented, how much water you could actually save. And this question I could ask of any one of the seven states before us, so I, I don't want to pick on you particularly, but uh, I think you did mention collaboration, certainty, and other words like that, so that's why I'm asking you the question. Can you give us some idea of how much water is available if you were able to implement conservation across the board in your state? Um, yes, and, and thank you for that uh, question, Cong Congressman Mintz. Um, as part of our work through our Colorado Water Plan, conservation has been one of the pillars that has stood up in how we um, move forward to uh, a long range future. Of, of water for Colorado and conservation um, being highlighted in that is just one of the solutions. There is quantification in that to some level um, along with goals with, um, but that's not just in the Colorado River Basin, it's across the entire state. So there's a goal of over 400,000 acre feet of conservation measures to take place, um, but that is across the state. So I'd have to um, get back to you on exacts of, of um, what would potentially be possible, not all of our states in the Colorado River Basin. And then thank you for that. I'd love to see those numbers. And if they exist somewhere, please uh, share them. Uh, Mr. Shockroff, uh, Utah, there's a uh, uh, an unfortunate uh, ref what um, focus on agriculture as the source of water in situations like this, and uh, the result, of course, is that uh, agriculture gets uh, uh, cut off in because there's a lot more people in cities than there are on farms. Uh, my question to you is, uh, what should be the farmers be doing given this? Uh, is focused that they find themselves uh, squarely within. Thank you uh, for the question. You are exactly right. Uh, a large majority of the water in Utah, and I believe the other states as well, is used for agriculture. And I agree with you that many times agriculture gets a bad name for uh, using water or wasting water. When in reality, a, a farmer uses water, what, what he diverts uh, part of that is used by the production of the crop. Part of that returns to the river, which turns out to be the next appropriator's water supply. And so it's not it's not as simple as some people think. Simply diminishing use for agriculture automatically produces water for culinary purposes. In my in my mind, it's got to be a market based situation where there's an advantage for those who are using water that has historically been used for agriculture to move it to municipal 
And that's typically how it's been done in Utah. And it, it happens quite um, comfortably if those conditions are set willing, willing buyer, willing seller. Thank you. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Benz. Uh, we're glad to be joined by two members of the Nevada delegation for uh, the next set of questions. So we will now recognize uh, Representative Dina Titus for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for giving us an opportunity to sit in on this very informative uh, panel. You know, I represent the heart of the Las Vegas Valley. We've got over 2 million people there and 40 million tourists coming every year. So the water in the Colorado River that goes to supply us uh, is, is a very important issue. I'd like to address our representative, Mr. Insminger. Uh, there are three factors happening here all at the same time. One, Southern Nevada is the, one of the fastest growing areas in the country and increased by 18% over the last decade. But this has been going on for much longer than that. We went from 1.3 million folks to uh, 2.3 million between 2002 and today. There was a time when you had to build an elementary school a month to keep up with the growth. So growth is one factor. Second, we're the fastest warming community in the country. Uh, I think you called it aridification. So that's the second factor. Third, we got the smallest amount of water in the allocation from the river to start with. And yet I think we're one of the best stewards of the amount that we do get. I was really glad that you mentioned in your comments, the large scale water recycling project investment act, which I'm a co-sponsor of and pointed out the money that will go towards water projects in the bills that we're being considered for infrastructure. All this time, these three factors are going on though, we have reduced our consumption of water. It's pretty amazing how we've been able to do that. Uh, could you talk about how we can sustain growth or continue growth while also reducing our consumption of water from the river? Uh, absolutely, uh, Representative Titus. Uh, and as you said, it's uh, good, good to see a couple friendly Nevada faces on the call after uh, being outnumbered by the New Mexicans uh, for most of the year. Um, as you say, since 2002, uh, we have uh, reduced our depletions off of the Colorado River by 23% while at the same time adding over 800,000 new residents. And we did that largely by uh, taking out turf. Uh, but we've arrived at a place where in order to continue to accommodate the type of growth we're seeing, uh, we need to continue on that conservation journey. And that's why the Nevada uh, legislature adopted this year uh, Assembly Bill 356, which prohibits the use of Colorado River water or non-functional turf uh, in the Las Vegas Valley by 2026. And that will save about 10% of our Colorado River allocation just by getting grass out of you know, street medians and, and places where you know, nobody's kids or grandkids are, are, are using it. So uh, the key to our journey is continuing to control our demands because as you say, uh, climate change isn't doing us any favors either. We estimate that our gallons per capita per day will go up by nine gallons between today and 2035, just because of increased uh, warming. Well, I know you had that great project where you could convert your yard to desert landscaping. And I think that was a big success. Could you just share with us a little about how that worked? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we refer to that as our water sewer landscape uh, program. Uh, right now we pay $3 a square foot to incentivize people to take out grass. Uh, and the results have been pretty staggering. Again, since the turn of the century, we've spent about $250 million of local funds uh, to fund that program. And as a result of that, you could actually lay an 18 inch wide piece of sod around the circumference of the earth at the equator uh, with all the grass that we remove from the Las Vegas Valley. Wow. You know, people think about Las Vegas and golf courses and big resorts and fountains and things that, but in reality, they use only a small percentage of the water that's consumed here in the Valley. Is that right? That's correct. Well, actually, you know, Clark County, which is home to 76% of the state's population, uses less than 5% of the water that's available within the state of Nevada. And if you look at that resort uh, industry that, as you said, brings in 45-ish million visitors a year, they use less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the water that's available within the state of Nevada. 
Are you working with DRI on any water conservation projects? Yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to, to sit on the board of trustees for the Desert Research Institute, and we coordinate with them regularly, both on uh, conservation initiatives, uh, water quality issues in Lake Mead, uh, and, and any number of other you know, scientific endeavors. Are you involved at all with the St. George Water Project just north of here? I, I am not, but Mr. Shawcroft is here if you'd like to ask him about that. I'll save that for next time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now you're back. Thank you, Representative Titus. And uh, we're going to go to your Nevada neighbor, uh, Congresswoman Susie Lee. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Huffman, and thank you, Ranking Member Benz, for hosting this uh, really important meeting and all, to all of our witnesses for their excellent uh, testimony. As uh, Congresswoman Titus said, uh, Southern Nevada and the entire Southwest is facing unprecedented drought. Uh, as we know, in my district, Lake Mead, which supplies water for over 25 million people across Nevada, Arizona, and California, is at its lowest level since construction in the 30s. Uh, and to help address this country, uh, this crisis, um, so much more must be done to accurately measure consumptive use, which includes programs like Open ET. And I want to thank Mr. Tyrell and Mr. Shawcroft for recognizing the importance of this program in their testimony, uh, which Congresswoman Titus was developed through uh, Desert Research Institute. Um, here in the House, I've introduced the Open Access Evapotranspiration Data Act, that's a long word, Open ET, um, with fellow colleagues of this committee to establish a program under the Department of Interior that uses uh, publicly available data from satellites and weather stations to provide uh, measurements and estimates of evapotranspiration and help water managers, farmers, and ranchers make decisions about their water use. And I've also been working to secure federal funding for the large-scale water recycling projects. In fact, my colleagues on this committee, uh, with along with them, the Large Scale Water Recycling Investment Act was included in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. Uh, Mr. Ensminger, as you mentioned in your testimony, the Southern Nevada Water Authority is partnering with Metropolitan Water District of Southern California on a multi-billion dollar regional water recycling project. Um, can you speak to how this proposed uh, project will provide tangible benefits to Nevada California and other communities along the Colorado River Basin. Uh, ab absolutely. So, in, in its simplest explanation, you know, what the MET project will do is take wastewater that's currently being discharged into the Pacific Ocean uh, and thereby can't be reutilized, uh, treat that. Uh, either inject it into aquifers uh, in Southern California or perhaps even take it to direct potable reuse, uh, thereby extending uh, the use of that water in, in Southern California. And in concept, what we have discussed with Matt is that uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority would invest $750 million towards the capital uh, needs of that project and in return for that, uh, Metropolitan would leave a small amount of their Colorado River entitlement in Lake Mead for our use over the period of the, the project. And, and I believe the uh, Central Arizona Water Conservancy District has now also uh, signed on to participate uh, in that project. So in a very real way, uh, with the funding uh, that is in the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill, this is a regional project with large amounts of funding from local agencies, uh, but also a partnership with our federal partners. Thank you. And how how would you rank this in sort of in our fight against the worsening drought in all of the tools in your toolbox? Well, well, I think what I would say is of all the testimony we've heard today, that's the only project that's actually adding new water into the fight uh, against the the problem. We've talked a lot about how to use less and how many more needs there are, but in terms of introducing real wet water that's not currently available, that, that's the, the project and the model for the future. Thank you. Um, I'm actually looking out on my backyard, which does have uh, artificial turf as part of the Water Smart uh, project. So, um, I, you know, we've been fighting to combat drought uh, as a member of appropriations with these uh, such activities. So, in addition to supporting regional recycled water partnerships, are there any other 
specific types of investments in water related climate resilience uh, in the Colorado River Basin that needs federal assistance? Well, I, I think the most uh, obvious one is there. there is a federal obligation contained in the DCP to contribute 100,000 acre feet a year to the protection of Lake Mead uh, elevations. And while Reclamation has done a good job trying to uh, meet that obligation, they, they haven't quite gotten all 100,000 acre feet a year in there. So providing, I think, Reclamation with additional funding so that they can meet that goal, uh, but also expand uh, the programs that Mr. Bishotsky talked about in, in his testimony uh, in, in terms of agreements with some of the tribes in Arizona uh, and, and expanding system conservation efforts uh, would be a good use of federal funds. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I, uh, I would yield. Well, I thank our colleagues from Nevada for uh, closing us out on a on a, I think more hopeful note, talking about some projects and strategies that can really make a difference in addressing these challenges. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for Mr. their. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, was I going to get a chance to? Is ask that Mr. Costa? I, yeah, Mr. Costa. Of panel. course, of course, we want to include you. I didn't have that in my notes that you wanted to jump in, but you are recognized. I've been listening tentatively uh, to all the debate and appreciate it very much for both panels. Thank you. Uh, let me make two statements and then ask uh, uh, what my father would say is a $64,000 question, but I based upon the value of water per acre foot these days, I suspect it's a lot more than $64,000. Um, first statement is, is I subscribe to some of the comments that we made earlier that uh, um, uh, our water allocation for the uh, production of food is a national security issue. It really is. Less than 5% of our nation's population is engaged in agriculture production, but, but majority of Americans, uh, maybe as a result of the pandemic, with schools and restaurants closed, began to understand that, um, that food doesn't come from your restaurant or your, your, your favorite store, but it comes from people, farm workers and farmers uh, throughout the country who, who put it on America's dinner table every night. The second uh, point I wanna make has been uh, part of the witnesses statements uh, here that we've heard this afternoon, and it's not new and it's something I think we all subscribe to. And that is using all the water tools in our water toolbox. And I'd be interested, uh, Ms. Mitchell talked about quantification of the pillar of conservation. And I strongly subscribe to that notion because we've done a lot in conservation, but I think for all of the witnesses, it'd be nice if we could quantify how much more we can uh, uh, build upon in terms of conservation as a, a part of one of the water tools in our water toolbox. But let me get back to the point I made in my opening statement, which was that uh, the law of the river and the quantification of the upper and lower basin states amounted to some 17 million acre feet of water that it was determined at that time was the annual um, flow of the Colorado River, and, and we know that in the last two decades, it's been more like 12.4 million acre feet. And that doesn't account for other Native American tribes that have reserved water right claims that have yet to be resolved. Um, so uh, there's just a tremendous amount of demand. And with climate change, we know the yield is only going to decline. So this is the question I'd like to submit to all of you. Um, and if you want to provide written statement to the your answer, I would I think we would appreciate that. So let's say the annual yield over the next 30 years is 10 million acre feet. I don't know, with climate change, maybe it's plus or minus. How do we take into account how we got to the original allocation with the upper and lower basin states and the and the tribes, the sovereign nations, and then reallocate that on a lot less water? That's the $64,000 question, but it's also a lot more than that because, frankly, of the value and the importance of water security to everybody, everybody. So how do we, it was so difficult to agree upon 17 million acre feet, which we know now is not there. How do we uh, agree among the upper and lower basin states and the, and the native tribes on uh, a, a reduced amount knowing that we're all going to use all the water tools in our water toolbox and we're going to conserve and we're going to do all that stuff. Okay. Um, so that's the $64,000 question. So in a minute and 34 seconds, do any of the witnesses want to 
answer Mr. Acosta's Hunger Games scenario of uh, <laughs> how we get through that kind of shortfall? Congressman Acosta, I'll take a first crack at it. Um, the law of the river is a series of agreements, court adjudications, uh, all down the line. Um, the DCP being the most recent one. I've been on several panels that the question is, is the DCP enough? And I know, and I was involved in the quantification agreement a number of years ago, and, and that was a success of sorts. They're very much a success to, to reduce water use uh, in California. And so when you look at that progression, it's an incremental change. And currently we're in the process of meeting uh, quite frequently uh, with the, as uh, the lower basin and the upper basin and the seven basin states in, in trying to quantify additional measures of conservation that we can do in the interim, but also uh, working on the 2026 guidelines. So it is really a series of collaborative uh, uh, work together that, that tries to quant one, quantify and two, develop the areas in which we're going to make those conservation uh, investments. Would it be too easy to d digest that we use all the water tools in the water toolbox and we measure what that adds up to? And then we take the percentage of water that was allocated in the difficult uh, law of the river contract and on a percentage basis, reduce it by that factor to 10 million acre feet or whatever we determine the yield to be. Yeah, one of the challenges with that is the long-term water rights that folks have. Both I know, in the I know. Basin, right? <laughs> and so it's that that's the challenge. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a collaborative process to get through that. And, uh, uh, you know, I will say one thing is you, uh, I, I noticed that, and no disrespect, I noticed a number of folks had, uh, had lunch while during the during the uh, uh, panel today, and uh, I, I take your I take your comments to heart. Is that uh, the food that we eat is actually uh, you know it comes from water, and this is uh, food security is an important issue, and uh, you know uh, food equals water, and you know we all are a part of that process, and the, the food production cycle is very important. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we'll look forward to continuing to work on this. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a great question you ended with, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, if any witness wants to provide any uh, written supplemental answers to that or any other questions, we'd all be happy to see it. Um, let me just check to see if there are any other colleagues that uh, were hoping to jump in with questions. I don't want to overlook anyone, uh, but I don't think there are. And so I think at this point, we're going to bring this uh, first day of our Colorado River Basin uh, hearing to a close. Uh, again, thanks to the witnesses on this second panel and to all the members for their great questions. Members of the committee may have some additional questions uh, for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to those in writing under Committee Rule 3.0. Members of the committee must submit those witness questions within three business days. Uh, after the hearing and the record will be held open for 10 business days to allow for responses. If there's no further business and seeing none, uh, then without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thanks.